So welcome to this webinar with a live Q&A session with Lund University. Uh, we're here today, of course, to talk about our master's programs in the subject area of area studies. So we're very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Cecilia Jepsen, and I work with international marketing and recruitment here at the university. And I will be the moderator of the Q&A session today, which means I will be the one handling Frank and Matthias the questions today. Uh, Frank, would you like to introduce yourself, who you are, which program you represent? Sure thing. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Frank Schreier, and I'm here representing the master's program in politics and society of the contemporary Middle East. Um, my job is entirely about admissions and registration. I do this for all of the master's programs that belong to the graduate school at the Faculty of Social Science office. So there are five programs I work with, um, and this is one of them. So I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about this program, and I look forward to hearing all the questions you have um, and talking more. Wonderful. Matthias, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. We are all um, very, very happy and grateful for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, to everybody listening, I have a terrible cold, so if I will cough and sneeze in the middle of answering uh, important uh, questions, I already start by apologizing. But I will do my best to answer uh, correct, uh, correctly and, and give uh, all the best information. Um, my name is, uh, as Cecilia said, Matthias Novak, and I work as a program coordinator and one of the main lecturers also in our uh, field, European studies. Um, I am the head of uh, the master programs, master of arts in European studies. That is simply studying uh, um, the process of European integration, European Union, but with a particular humanistic profile. So coordinator and lecturer in European studies, uh, Lund University. Thank you so much, Matthias. Uh, I do want to mention that we were supposed to have a third panelist here today uh, representing the master's program in Asian studies. Unfortunately, the program director had something else in his schedule, so he couldn't attend today. But if you have questions about the Asian studies master's program, you can still ask them in the Q&A and I will see if I can find some details or some answers to your questions. Uh, otherwise, we also have a session with current students happening at 4 p.m. Swedish time, where we will have a representative from the Asian Studies Master's Program for, for your specific questions. Uh, so save those specific questions for then if you're joining that session too. Uh, but in either way, uh, we like I said, we do have the Q&A in this session. So whatever questions you have about the programs, uh, take your opportunity to ask Matthias and Frank in the Q&A, and we will attend to your questions as soon as we can. There are no stupid questions, they're all welcome. Uh, so just go ahead and do so. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for some questions to pop in, I was thinking, Matthias, if someone is interested in studying the European Master Studies program, why should they choose this specific program. Thank you very, very much, uh, Cecilia, for that question. Uh, well, the answer uh, can be partially connected to, uh, to the phrase humanist profile. There are uh, quite many uh, programs, master programs in European studies uh, in, in Europe, uh, even in, in uh, the Nordic countries. However, uh, according to my knowledge, we are the only one uh, focusing on European studies uh, while emphasizing such concepts, words, phrases like uh, European Union's cultural and language policies, uh, European identity, European culture, European cultural history. So we have a humanist profile. In addition to uh, gaining knowledge, considering uh, European Union's institutions and uh, governance policy making uh, processes, which is also an important part of our, of our um, program. Uh, I call it the political science dimension or even um, aspects of European law. We simultaneously focus analytically so on uh, questions relating, uh, related to, to um, European cultural uh, policy. Uh, we try to place uh, current political development within the European Union in a larger uh, European co uh, context, both historically and geographically. 
So we, uh, that means uh, <clears throat> that we, we actually, our courses start with uh, the history of the ancient Greece. And thereafter we go through, through the middle ages and through the Renaissance until, until present day. So simply our students, they, they know very much about the European Union, but they also know generally a lot about the European history and European cultural history as well. So the historical dimension is, is somewhat specific for us. And then the ge geographical aspect, uh, I can just add that we do not limit ourselves to European Union and its institutions, but uh, those uh, graduating from, from our program can have a focus, uh, write a master thesis about, for example, political, social, uh, cultural processes outside of the European Union, for example, in Ukraine, for example, in Moldova, uh, ba the Balkans, and so on. So a broader historical and geographical uh, perspective with a humanist uh, profile and large interest in culture, language, identities, and so on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matthias. And Frank, if I ask you the same question, if someone's interested in studying area studies, why should they study politics and society of the contemporary Middle East? Well, um, when it comes to studying the Middle East in general at the master's level, I think there are a few things that a lot of people don't realize about the program we have here at the social science faculty for Middle Eastern studies um, in this program in particular. Um, we see that when students are looking for a master's program um, or a master's or PhD program in Middle Eastern studies, they're often looking towards um, the, the United Kingdom or the United States because publishing um, in English your master's thesis or then in doctoral work um, is really something that people look for. Uh, when, especially when it comes to Middle Eastern studies, one of the best places to you know, study the Middle East you would think would be in the Middle East, but um, students are actually finding that it's harder to, to do programs in English and they want to get that sort of international approach to, um, to their further studies or job work. So the first thing to know is that the, this program, Politics and Society of the Contemporary Middle East, is in English and allows you to, to, to get started in English. But more than that, it doesn't require any previous knowledge of a regional language which a lot of programs throughout Europe actually require that. So this sort of gives it, um, when we do that on purpose because we want to uh, enable more people to have access to this field and, and this these studies. So, um, so that was a strategic decision. Um, but when it comes to the contemporary Middle East and we talk about the, the subject area itself, um, it's it's really interesting because um, it, it starts right away with this notion of, of what we mean with Middle East. And Middle East is a historically changeable concept. It's um, a geographic area. It's a, it's, some, it's a language area if we include North Africa um, and other places. It's, it can be a religious area if we include the Islamic world, um, which goes throughout Asia and South Asia. And so there are a lot of aspects that are really important to when we take into consideration what the contemporary Middle East actually means. Um, now, we actually really like having historical perspectives, too, and that's why in our entry requirements, um, human, humanities or history, history backgrounds are actually really great for this program, because you're able to, to bridge that historical background and apply it to the contemporary Middle East and what it means. Um, but I think that this program is, is actually really important, and in the words of the, the program director herself, um, she says you can't understand the world today without understanding the contemporary Middle East. And I think that for scholars who want to take a regional or area studies approach, um, a, a deep and broad and important understanding of the Middle East is actually crucial. Thank you very much for a good answer there as well. So it's my understanding that the historical aspect <clears throat> is an important part in both programs here, uh, as well, of course, as, as the present time. Uh, but if we talk about our applicants, so of course we're open for applicant applications right now until 16th of January. Um, Matthias, what would you say is the most common questions you get from applicants during this time of year about the program as such? I would say that uh, one of the most common questions, perhaps the most common is uh, what should I send? What should I upload? What kind of documents? And uh, to make it very, very simple and give a direct answer, I would say that generally what we looked uh, 
at his uh, previous academic uh, record, of course. And in addition to that, we ask uh, each and every applicant to write a letter of motivation, simply stating and writing why they would like to come uh, particularly to us. And in addition to uh, that letter of motivation, also two letters of uh, references. So previous uh, academic record, letter of motivations, and two letters of references. That is what we uh, look at and, and uh, require. Mm. And on the basis of uh, all these, all these uh, documents, uh, we simply uh, make a decision uh, later on how many students we can admit. Um, generally, we are admitting uh, around between 20 to 25 students each autumn each year. Okay. Uh, and when it comes to the program specific documents, sorry, Frank, I'm going to let you in as well, but Matthias, uh, do you have templates for those program specific documents or are students supposed to just submit the documents using their own templates? Generally, we have all kinds of um, all the information regarding that question is uh, available on our web page. So I think that the best thing uh, to do is simply to uh, just Google Master of Arts in European Studies Lund University. And then there are links also uh, with the email address to our student counselor, to myself. So the, the easiest way is simply to follow the um, uh, application requirements as they are uh, clearly stated on the web page. Maybe that is the, the easiest way. And of course, if there are any additional question, each and every um, uh, applicant is always very much welcome to co contact our student counselor, counsel or, or myself. Wonderful, thank you. I actually just posted the link to the program page in the chat for anyone who's interested. So you can save that web page for later. Uh, the program pages are usually the gold mine when making an application because that's where you find all the details you need in terms of entry requirements, selection criteria, uh, program specific documents and so on. Uh, moving on to you, Frank, what are the most common questions you get from students during the application process? Um, I'd have to have to say the same as Matthias. People are, are really curious about if they're eligible first and then what they um, would have to upload. So um, in order to be eligible for the program, I can maybe start there. Um, that is a social science background, but we also accept backgrounds in area studies if you've studied another region or in history, economic history or economic development. Um, we find that those are really relevant and, and good backgrounds for this program or something that's the equivalent. So um, a lot of times the question I get is, is my is my background equivalent to these things? And so in that case, you're, you're most welcome to um, email us and I can take a look at your transcript in advance just to, to let you know if um, if it looks like you would be eligible or not, you can email us at this email address. And, and it's very common, we get this question a lot. So um, I'm real, more than happy to take a look um, and see so that that way you can um, you know, prioritize and apply to those that, that are most, um, most suited for your background. But beyond that, when it comes to program specific documents too, um, we do ask for um, a motivation letter and the questions and how that works can be found on our website Wonderful. there too. There's no template, but we do have specific questions that we look for um, answers to. And that's one a common thing that people, um, that, some, that some applicants miss and that can make your application more competitive. Since the, the letter isn't a requirement, it's just something um, that we ask and use during the selection round is something that can help your application if you make sure to include the motivation letter. Wonderful. So I'm going to stick with you again, Frank, for, for another question here. Uh, and that is sort of related to what we just talked about. But what is the most common mistake that applicants do when applying to, to the politics and society of the contemporary Middle East program? Mm, yeah, good question. And it's definitely the missing documents. Um, that I see by far um, is that someone has missed that document. And, and it's a mistake that won't cost you. Um, eligibility, you can still be eligible for the program without including all of this program specific documents. Um, but when you include them, it definitely helps you rank higher in the selection and increase your chances. Um, the other thing I would say on this note is um, 
a mistake that can easily be avoided is checking if you're eligible first before you apply. So look on the website, we, we post our eligibility requirements. You can also email us at the email address I provided in the chat um, if you're unsure, but just knowing ahead of time if, if, you, you know, if you look like you'll be eligible or not can save you a lot of time and help you prioritize better, which then puts you in a better position for getting scholarships for your first priority program if you get into it and things like that. It helps in a lot of ways. So um, definitely documents and making sure you're eligible before you, um, before you apply. And this is something we always tell students as well. It's extremely important. First step should be to make sure you actually meet the requirements for the programs. However, it can sometimes be difficult to understand as some programs are more flexible in terms of uh, who they let into the program. Some, some programs are very specific in terms of specific courses or modules you must have studied in your bachelor's. Uh, so it's, it's important to check those details before applying. And Matthias, if I ask you the same question, uh, for students applying for the European Studies Master's program, what is the most common mistake applicants do? My answer will be uh, somewhat similar to what uh, Frank just said. Uh, it is simply easy to make a mistake uh, in the process of, of uh, uploading, sending uh, all necessary uh, do documents. And that is, I believe that it is quite easy to avoid that. Uh, so I, I really speak strongly directly from my heart, if I can use such a phrase to, to all um, who are listening to us. Please, dear prospective students, go um, very carefully through all each and every information uh, point on our web page. So, so nothing will be missed because it did happen sometimes that I, I am the one uh, responsible for uh, making a selection. And it, it happens sometimes that I, I receive a wonderful letter of motivation and, and I, I read it just warm my heart and I really feel this student really wishes to come to us. But then I see that, whoa, I cannot find the grades or, or other um, formal merits are, are not uploaded. And, and we cannot admit that student even though we, de facto in a way would really like to. Uh, so just follow uh, carefully all the requirements. And I also um, will add one more time that the letter of motivation is, is important because uh, this is something, uh, um, a possibility for each and every, every, every applicant to express uh, once again, big words from the bottom of your heart. Why do you want to come precisely to us? There are many other programs all over the globe. Is there anything particular which we are offering that caught your attention? And if so, please let us know. We would be very grateful uh, for, for uh, that. Uh, lastly, I just add that uh, in, the, in the chat, I also uh, wrote the email address to our study counselor, Susan, who can also answer all possible uh, questions, both the technical administrative ones but also those related to the academic content uh, of the program and so on. It's wonderful. Uh, I want to remind all of you that we do have the Q&A feature in this webinar. So if you as an attendee to this webinar would like to ask some questions, go ahead and post your questions in there and, and we will tend to those. Uh, we actually just had a question uh, from a student here. Uh, I just want to know the opportunities to have a full scholarship to Lund University for students from North Africa. Well, this, uh, I do have to remind everyone that this is a program specific webinar, which uh, means this is your opportunity to ask specific questions for the program staff. Uh, when it comes to the scholarship opportunities, I would instead recommend you to join one of our uh, general sessions, which we're also hosting. On the 16th of December, we have a how to apply for master study session, where we will walk you through the steps of how to apply and also talk about scholarships and funding. Uh, but I can send all of you a link in the chat as well if you want to learn more about uh, funding opportunities uh, at the university. So if you have any more program specific questions, please go ahead and add those to the Q&A and we will of course answer those. Take the opportunity now that we have Matthias and Frank here today. And um, so Frank, what kind of students are you actually looking for uh, in your program? Well, how, what what kind of background, what kind of personality? <laughs> Good question. I mean, we get such an amazing diversity 
of students who apply for this program. I mean, and so it's hard to, to filter it down into one specific type, but I can talk about some who are most successful in the program. I think there are a few characteristics that, that we've noticed over the years. Um, and the first is, is um, a, a really sincere curiosity about the region. Um, and we see that come up in different ways, um, whether that's someone from the region who wants to, you know, study in English and, and do the, a higher, like a master's or a doctoral program in English. Um, so that's one, that's that connection. Um, we get a lot of what our program director calls legacy students who are students who are first or second generation uh, from outside of the region whose parents had moved away from the region and they have that kind of personal connection. Um, we also have people who are curious in the region from other re from other regions, and that um, that is really um, another a big big portion of the of the types of students we get um, who have a sincere interest, whether that's an academic interest, uh, development interest, um, uh, personal interest from personal experience, work, um, so many different reasons people have a connection to the region. Um, so that's that's an important one. But I'd say the other the other thing when it comes to sincere curiosity about the region, but then also um, just the the desire and the willingness and the ability to um, you know write academically on in English and, and that that part too is they they're really here to study and um, have some experience writing on the masters or writing on you know higher education in English. Um, is a big one that our program director has also said is really important when it comes to who the ideal candidate is. Um, we don't have any language requirement like most, like a lot of programs throughout Europe do. Um, but if you have any experience with um, a language from the recent region, then that looks really good on the on an application. Um, and it's something that really helps because of the different exchange agreements we have too, where some of the exchange agreement agreements in certain countries actually require one of the languages, whether that's Arabic, Farsi, or French. So, um, um, so language can be a, pu a plus, but it's not a requirement. And that's really good to know because that's quite a common question as well. And Frank, would you say how many students do you generally have in, in your program and how many of those would you say are international students? Yeah, well, we usually get between 15 and 20 students who are on the program and we admit about 30. So um, that's or what we admit with, you know, the expectation of not having more than 30. So we admit a little bit more than that because not everyone always makes it for different reasons. Um, and when it comes to percentage international to non-international, I'd say um, we're actually majority international compared to if we're taking national as Sweden and international as any, any other country, then it's majority international. I think we only have, um, I'm not going to give a number if it would be wrong, so I don't have it in front of me, but it is majority international this year and it was the same last year. So. Fantastic. And Matthias, I'm shortly going to ask you the same questions. We just had a few questions coming in in the Q&A, so I thought we should tend to those first. Uh, we had a question here saying that I'm currently studying my bachelor's in international studies and specializing in the Middle East and Arabic. I have already followed many courses covering the MENA, and therefore I'm looking to further increase my knowledge of the region. Would this master be able to support me in this, or is it really more introductory? Frank. What do you say about this? This is um, a great question. And yeah, this is this is the type of background that lends itself perfect to this program. Um, and really this idea of building on previous knowledge. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I, I'd be curious to know what your, what your career um, intentions are, like what you wanna do after the program. But I think that this kind of program, um, we start with an introductory course, but that's just to level set with the whole cohort. What do we mean by Middle East? What do we mean by contemporary? Some of those things. Um, and actually some of those definitions might be a little bit different from, from your background, Renee. So um, it could be, um, it could be in, even good for you who has experience with the Middle East, um, with or with Middle Eastern studies already. Um, so I think that this kind of program could support you, but I'd be curious also to know um, from a counseling perspective what your goals are to know if the program matches perfectly, but it, it sounds like it sounds like it's the type of program that would help you build on your previous knowledge for sure. 
Thank you, Frank. And of course, that's always an important question to ask oneself, what you want to do after graduating a program, uh, as that actually can make you decide which program is relevant to you. Uh, and Matthias, we have a question here about European studies as well. Uh, they're asking what the assessments are like for the European studies master's program. Is it mainly exams, assignments, or a mixture? Like when you're studying the program, what is the academic life like or the teaching style rather? It is a mixture. It is a mixture. Uh, we have uh, what I call uh, old style classical uh, exams, written exams, but we also have uh, seminars. Uh, students uh, make uh, various presentations, uh, presenting uh, the, the results of their uh, small pilot projects, uh, small research uh, projects. So, so it is very, very diverse. But in addition to, to uh, what is going on in, inside the classroom, which is very, very diverse, both lectures, uh, seminars, webinars, uh, a lot of interactive moments. Uh, we watch European films and discuss them and so on and so on. I would like to add that we also have a, a strong focus on internships and employability. So within the framework of our uh, program, as I said before, we have this political science uh, oriented dimension and the humanist uh, one as well, thinking, uh, thinking very much that uh, multidisciplinary perspectives on European integration can go uh, hand in hand and, and, and provide students with uh, very good expertise in, in what's going on um, in, uh, in uh, Europe today. And at the same time, within that program, uh, which is two years, um, it, it takes two years um, to finish the program, half a year, we offer internship uh, possibilities. So each and every student, we cannot guarantee uh, internship for uh, everyone, but more than 90% of those students coming to us wishing to do an internship somewhere in Europe uh, are actually doing that. It can be a, an, an internship in Brussels uh, connected to uh, various Euro official institutions, agencies of the European Union. But not necessarily so. It, it, it is also so not uncommon that uh, our students, particularly because of, uh, of the humanist profile and orientation, they work, for example, within European uh, media. Uh, recently, I had a student who uh, was an intern at the journal uh, Politico writing about politics and, and culture. So journalism, European, uh, Europe, European journalism, very popular. Uh, humanitarian projects related to, uh, to aid and um, development uh, policies. Um, agencies, institutions, organizations working with um, migration, for example. Uh, various, additionally, various uh, cultural uh, and educational uh, programs and projects. Um, we have, if I, if I remember correctly, our students have been in 29 different countries, uh, having internships in 29 different uh, countries um, and, and very successfully so. So the, the, the focus on employability, possibilities to internship and future work, future career is also something that, that a new student will feel while coming to us from day one. It will be, like I said, the history of ancient Greece, but it will be combined with the question, where will I work yeah. four years from now? Yeah, for sure. And Matthias, talking about like the kind of students you have in your program, would you say that you have mainly European students in your program, or do you also have students from outside of Europe studying European studies? Generally, it looks uh, like that. Between 60 and 70% uh, are students from uh, different European uh, countries, and around 30, 25, 30% of students are coming uh, from outside of Europe. We have had many students from China, from Mexico, from Thailand, from Canada, from uh, United States of America. So in that sense, it is very, very international. And of course, you can work with European studies outside of Europe as well. Like Absolutely. If you work towards European, yeah, European countries. 
Absolutely. All kinds of international, transnational uh, projects, uh, political projects, cultural projects, business projects, humanitarian projects, where uh, European Union, as European Union, or particular European organizations, institutions work with partners outside of Europe. That is that is uh, very, very common as a field of interest for, for us and our students. Yeah. And just like you said as well, Frank, that the working with the Middle Eastern studies is actually something like you need to have a lot of knowledge about the Middle East if you're working with area studies in general. Um, so if we talk more about the content of the programs, uh, Frank, would you say, is it possible for students to do elective courses? Is there an opportunity for students to get some hands-on practical experience when studying the program? What does it look like? Totally. This is a good question because it's also something that's a little bit different um, with this program. Uh, this program is at the graduate school at the Faculty of Social Sciences. And what that, and I say that um, because it means something for the so social sciences faculty. And that just means that um, these programs have 30 credits of methods training. So um, it's, it's above average um, in terms of how much training you'll get in research methods and philosophy of science, um, sort of this like discovery of knowledge based courses, um, which is really nice. It lends itself extremely well to students who want to continue on um, in work in research or doctoral programs as well. But um, but in terms of some of the other features, um, there's definitely um, an option to take some elective courses during the third term. And the third term of the program is really the one that is a little bit less structured um, and gives students the freedom to sort of um, customize according to what they wanna do both for their thesis and for their um, their employment afterward. So, um, so there will be up to 15 credits, which in Sweden is one or two courses um, that you can take totally freestanding um, during the third term of the course, which is the second fall term. Um, and then there's two courses that are within the, the subject of contemporary Middle East that are required to take there. Um, so in place of, let's say, we have half of that term that is, is already scheduled for you, but that first half of the term that you get to either take freestanding courses or go on an internship for half of the term um, those are the two options that can be done there. Otherwise, the third option is to go abroad for the whole third term. Um, and because there's a requirement of those two courses that we, we I mentioned earlier, those two courses that are pre-planned for you, obviously you can't take them if you're abroad studying somewhere else. So the program director has actually set up an arrangement, um, different agreements with different universities that um, where she has pre-approved the courses that you would take there. Um, and she knows that they're relevant enough that they, they fulfill the requirements for those courses. And um, that gives students a chance to even go abroad, which can be really important for an area studies program. Um, and so, yeah, so there are a lot of options for, for your third term. And, and for this is actually a question we get a lot when we meet students, uh, both here and abroad, uh, for programs with an internship, um, if we start with you again, Frank, would, would you say that you help students find an internship or is it fully up to them to find, uh, find an internship themselves? We don't have any sort of agreements where an employer is waiting for an, an intern from graduate school or a graduate school program like this one. But we do have um, a lot of experience, have students going to internships. And we have a, a really long list of places we know students have had really good or successful internships here. And that always, um, that's one way that we can help through study advising, um, help you find one where students have gone before. We know that this is, this is something that's not only relevant, but students really liked. Um, so there's that aspect. But um, I think more than more than anything, also the program director of this program um, is is very aware of opportunities in the field, and she's very eager to help students um, find one. So while there aren't any of those guarantees, like that we have places waiting, um, we definitely help students along with the process through our our own experience with this. So. 
That's good. And, and for you, Matthias, in your European studies, you also talked about students going on internships abroad. Is that something that you help them with or would they have to find it themselves? I am just posting uh, on chat uh, to our entire program structure. So all students can see uh, a structure of the program, uh, which courses do we offer? And it looks very similar to, to what Frank was saying that um, we have uh, an elective term that is the third term during which uh, students can have internships or go abroad or study other courses. Since internship is something we treat um, formally as a course student is doing an internship, but it is a course. So either one can study uh, language or study more history or political science, or simply take an internship course. That's one of several elective possibilities. When it comes to um, helping our students, I am actually myself responsible for, for internships here. And I would once again say something uh, similar to what Frank said, that uh, we do not have concrete deals with concrete uh, places which are just waiting for our students. But the, if the question is, are we helping uh, our students to get relevant, interesting uh, internships, the answer is 100% yes, yes, yes. So I am myself uh, writing letter of uh, recommendations, uh, functioning as a person of reference, uh, providing um, examples, uh, having uh, meetings uh, um, with, with my students where I simply go through all possible existing possibilities, uh, including concrete examples and so on. So uh, we do not guarantee, but yes, we do provide as much help as possible. That's good. I think that's, uh, that's good news for the students as well, as it's something they sometimes worry about. Um, but of course, they have a lot of connections with previous students who've done internships as well, uh, you know, where they usually go. So usually there's some help to get at least, which is, which is very good. Uh, Frank, we have a question here for you in the Q&A. It's someone who's currently living in Egypt with the intention of learning Arabic and curious to know if there will be opportunities co to continue learning if accepted to the program. Does the school offer any courses in Arabic language learning that I can take while I work on the master's program? Such a good question. And um, the answer is yes, with an asterisk, because we don't offer them at the Faculty of Social Sciences because languages um, belong to a different faculty. So um, we do have agreements and partnerships with, um, with the Center for Middle Eastern Studies that offers courses in modern standard Arabic. Um, I'll go ahead and drop the link there if you're interested in what those look like. Um, and in this way, we can help, we can try to help students who are interested in learning the language. Perfect. Thank you for sharing the link as well. Always useful. Uh, and Elise, we have, a, we have a question here as well from another student uh, asking about Asian studies. And since we don't have a representative here today from the Asian studies program, I'm going to try to reply anyways. Uh, it's about proving your Korean language proficiency and Japanese proficiency when applying uh, it's not an entry requirement to know the Asian language, so it would be more to supplement my application. Well, I would say in general, when you apply, the only documents you actually have to provide are the ones requested by university admissions in Sweden and the program specific documents requested by the programs. So if you don't, if you can't find a way to, to find some sort of certificate of proof of these languages that you know, then you don't have to stress about it because it's not part of the actual requirements for the program. But if you have some kind of certificate that you can upload to prove you've taken courses uh, in these languages, you can of course submit them to your application. But just know that it's not a requirement and may hence not be part of the assessment either. I think that varies a bit from program to program. Uh, if you look at other documents or not. But so once again, we don't have the Asian Studies representative here today, but if you have questions, we can try to answer as much as possible by referring to their web pages and so on, at least. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Matthias, if I, if I am a student uh, in the European Studies Master's program, what would a typical day or week look like for me? How many classes would I have? How much group work? How, much, uh, how many assignments? How many books to read? <laughs> what would it look like? On Monday morning, you would uh, come uh, to uh, the Center for Languages and Literature. This is where we are physically based. 
and you would meet me, that would be uh, around 10 o'clock um, in the morning. And I would go inside the classroom uh, saying something like, uh, dear students, uh, let's start with uh, the biggest, most scientific ontological questions of them all. Are you happy? Uh, and then, and then be, approximately 50 to 60% of the students would say that they are happy. The rest they would say that they wish to become happy, which I will uh, follow up by saying, let's hope that I will make you happy before the end of the lecture. And then we will start. What will happen five minutes thereafter is that everything will become much more serious. And we will uh, go uh, in deep academic, intellectual, analytical discussions about, uh, like mentioned before, the history, uh, the political developments uh, of within uh, Europe, uh, with a focus on European Union, but not only European Union. And uh, thereafter, um, th the lecture will be between two to three hours long. And thereafter, you have free time to study at our wonderful uh, library um, or, or another libraries uh, here at Lund University. Um, and then uh, it will repeat itself on, on Tuesday. Probably on Wednesday, you will have a study free day where you will uh, you would meet in groups with other stu students, maybe preparing some project, reading books, uh, getting materials uh, for, for a presentation and so on and so on. And then a lecture or a seminar on Thursday and on Friday. So we would, we would meet within a classroom settings uh, three to four times a week. Uh, and there is also a lot of time uh, to be to be spent uh, on um, on your own individual or group studies in libraries, so conducting qualitative interviews with with NGOs present here in Lund, and so on and so on. It's a big diversity, but generally you would find everything from old school lecture to an evening uh, entitled European Cinema and Coffee. I think it's a fantastic way to to introduce your lectures, asking if everyone's happy. That's something we should tell everyone to do, and of course make everyone happy as well. Uh, well, as you can hear, we have quite an informal teacher student situation here in Sweden at Lund University, which is something most of our students actually enjoy a lot. Uh, it's a bit uncommon or weird when you first arrive, but I think quite you get used to it quite fast as well. Uh, but yeah, and, and Frank, if, if we ask you the same question, studying in the con contemporary Middle East program, is it lectures all day, every day, or is it also varying a bit? Um, I love this question because it's really one of those things that even though we're an international program, it really follows the Swedish model. And I think that this is really something that our international students find interesting um, because you come here and you take one course at a time. And um, a lot of our students from other countries are used to taking uh, you know, three to five courses simultaneously. Um, so this idea of sitting and focusing on one course at a time is something that's new for students. And I love that moment um, when they realize they're like, wait, I'm only taking one course. Um, but following the Swedish model, full-time studies means full-time studies. And that's that thing is that even though it's one course at a time, it's it's equivalent to full-time work here. It's really considered that. And um, you're looking at 37 to 40 hours um, of expected work. So, um, you, and you don't spend all of that time in lecture. Um, and that's really the cool part. And I'll say that's really the third feature of, of the um, Swedish model here is you'll have lecture and seminar two to three, sometimes four times a week. Um, but that's only one component because the second component is so common here in Sweden is, is to work in groups. So then you'll have a lot of group work. Um, and then with that, a lot of self-study time. And one of the best tips I could give um, someone who's who's coming and you know wants to come study in Sweden is to treat the libraries almost like an office. I, I know just that a lot of students who are really successful in that self-study um, mindset go to the library for, for working days, you know, hours at a time, um, bringing their lunch packed or, or going out. There's lots of places with student discounts. So you'll find tons of good food. But um, 
but um, I even did it when I was an international master's student here and had my colleagues who were my colleagues and, and are today my colleagues now. So, um, but that idea, we went to the library, we read, we prepared for the examination and not really that last part about it being the Swedish model, I would say is um, that the examination, you don't have quizzes throughout um, throughout the, the semester at the end of the course, you have usually, you have one or two um, um, essays throughout the course, but usually just one in our, in our program, at least one program at the end of one essay at the end of each course that is then um, the, the examination for, uh, for the, the course itself. So, so that's what a typical week looks like. A little bit of lecture, a little bit of seminar, a lot of self-study time, a lot of group work, um, and then those coming togethers in seminars too, after having read and having those seminars with the, with the course coordinator and the other peers in the course, those are, those are really um, exciting actually too, so yeah. Thank you, and I think this is something students have to get used to when they come here and not having lectures eight hours a day uh, for every day. Uh, but having group discussions and group work and seminars uh, and so on, where we actually discuss and learn together. And also the individual responsibility of actually, when I don't have classes, it doesn't mean that I'm free to do whatever I want. Uh, I still have to study. And I think that it's something that can be rather difficult in the beginning, but something you'll get used to. Uh, and something that, of course, the programs will, will talk to you about when you start as well, to study, to, to get you prepared for that. Uh, the with Matthias, um, talking about the content of the program again, do you have a lot of or any connections and collaborations with the industry uh, for students? Like, do you have guest lectures coming in from the industry or do you do field trips or uh, anything similar to that? Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for that question. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that you asked because it's partially related to, to what we covered before that, that we have a focus on employability and internships. So yes, we have a large uh, 15 uh, credits uh, points entitled project management and uh, communicative strategies. And during that course, uh, students um, learn how to, how to write big applications, for example, to the European Union to receive grants for all kinds of um, projects. Uh, during that course, um, it is the second term on the, um, on, on, on the program, we invite representatives from uh, European organizations, institutions who, who provide additional knowledge to whatever th what is being taught by, by the professors. So yes, there is a, there is a link um, between, between us, uh, let's say the, acad the academic, uh, academic dimension and, and um, the, um, the organizations, institutions, projects outside of the uh, uh, university. That can, in that context, I can also add uh, our contacts with, uh, with journalists, with, ma with uh, mass media. We can sometimes uh, invite, or, or even with, with the political representatives of the political lives, we do invite sometimes politicians or journalists, uh, uh, organize uh, discussion evenings and so on and so on. And sometimes these meetings, they are not only intellectually enriching, they also uh, provide concrete examples where our students can, um, about places where our students can apply later on for internship or even later on for work. Great. And Frank, if I ask you the same question, connections to the industry for students while studying. Definitely. I mean, I think um, you brought up the the big one of the biggest ones, Cecilia, and that was the the guest lecturing. Very common, um, very common that we have people coming in to give guest lectures, whether that's in the context of the course or in the context of open lectures or seminars that that all students at the faculty or at the graduate school are um, invited to. So um, a lot of interfacing with with people who are here, but um, then also yeah, through the um, the program director is is very involved in has a, a wide network. And so um, she, whenever there are opportunities for more connection with the field, it's usually within academia or research, um, then those come up as well. Um, but the third thing I'd also like to mention too is how much um, 
you can get involved in the field through student organizations at, um, at the university too. I mean, we're really not lying when we say that this is Sweden's best student life. Um, Swedes come from all over Sweden to study here for the opportunities that there are in student life. And we think of student life also in the context of just fun and, 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 and there's a lot of that too. But then there's also student life aspects that um, really help you develop professionally through, um, I know there's the, the Association for Development questions, which is um, very popular for our students. Um, but also other, um, either whether they're political, the, um, oh, how do you, what's, what is it called in, in English, Cecilia? UPF. Student unions. Um, no, they, the political, it's, yeah, UPF. Um, the I, I, um, oh, I don't know the word in Swedish, the UPF, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a political. It's a political forening. Yeah, that one. So, but I'm I'm blanking. And English is my native language, so why can't I can't do that. But I don't know. Um, English, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are just examples of some of the many that exist um, for students to get involved with um, in the field, which um, which I think are are excellent. And one of the things that makes Lund University as a university, outside of just the program I'm representing today, um, a really good choice, I think, for students. Association of Foreign Affairs. That was the word we were looking for. There it about. is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank May I you. just add the, a thing here? Uh, yeah. Yes, it's really good. Thank you so much, Frank, for bringing uh, that up because some, several of our students are very active in that in that association, and they organize lectures. And this is a uh, this is a very important part uh, to understand the, the let's call the the co cultural context uh, concerning education in Sweden. Sometimes, sometimes um, when we when we uh, have students from um, different countries, they may be exactly like Frank expect, uh, said before. They in the beginning they expect that they will be inside the building, our department, eight hours a day, every single day. And I always tell the students, but well, there is so much fun going around in Lund outside of this building. Why would I keep uh, you inside inside this building for eight hours? Come on, I'm not a bad person. So let's go out and explore. And there are such a rich and wonderful student life here in, in um, Lund. So the Association for Foreign Affairs is one example. Another example that is very popular among our students is called something uh, Cafe Multilingua. And I often uh, meet my students, uh, they, they simply uh, have a small uh, cafeteria in which they uh, sit and speak different languages. There is, for example, one uh, table around which um, everybody speaks French, another table around which everybody speaks uh, Spanish or uh, Arabic. It's not only uh, European languages, it can be Japanese, Chinese. And this is, this is organized by the students themselves. And I think that it's, it is important to, for all those listening to us that if you come to Lund, you will not only come to professors teaching you about the things, you will come to an intellectual and, and uh, adventurous environment that, that I believe is, is a wonderful one. Absolutely. And I, I think that's something as a student, you really, really have to take the opportunity to also enjoy all the student activities that are offered at the university, not only because it adds experience to, to your life, but also because you get to meet so many great people when you volunteer in different organizations and become active. I can guarantee you that you will get friends for the rest of your life doing so. Uh, we just have about six minutes to go, but I still have a very important question I would like to ask both of you. Uh, so, Matthias, where do students go after graduating? What are the career opportunities? Where are your alumni? It is very diverse, but I, I know that those listening to us would like concrete examples. So I will try to be as concrete uh, as possible, even though I have to emphasize the diversity. It can be so, so many different places, but uh, I can maybe generally summarize everything while, while referring to three categories. Uh, types uh, of, of uh, work or future uh, or career. Number one, category number one uh, is about institutions and agencies of the European Union. 
Some people moved to Brussels, to Strasbourg, to Frankfurt, to other European cities and uh, directly or indirectly work uh, within the frameworks of European Union institutions and agencies. That is one category, a big one. The second category would be um, something I, I generally label communication or communication oriented work. That is mass media, journalism, but even educational projects, communicative projects uh, and, and so on. So many of our students also work with, within that field. And then uh, the category number three, uh, I would label it uh, the category of culture. And here, we talk, we talk about uh, concrete culture oriented uh, project. It can be, it can be for example, uh, organizations like uh, European Center for Minority Languages or uh, projects uh, about uh, translations uh, or um, publishing houses uh, where, where, where the students with an interest in language and proficiency in, in several languages can really feel that yes, we, we have an interest in uh, international affairs in, in Europe, uh, but we also have a particular interest in, in the linguistic and cultural uh, dimension. Many of our students did find work uh, within the cultural sectors, even with concrete uh, tasks and assignments connected to language policies, uh, publications, uh, translation, and so on. Thank you so much. That's a lot of valuable information because, of course, everyone wants to know that if you study a master's degree, you actually have a job afterwards and some career opportunities. And so, Frank, of course, I'm going to ask you the same question. Where do students go after graduating from the program? Definitely. Um, and and I think one of the major ones, and I think that I mentioned at the very beginning is one of the competitive edge that like, gives this program a competitive edge is that it's in English. So it lends itself really well to PhD studies. Um, and that's so that's the first one. But it also um, it also lends itself really well to policy work or diplomacy um, are also some areas. But I also see any sort of um, work linked to migration, integration, or social development, development organizations, um, NGOs, this kinds of thing, our students end up in, in positions in such organizations um, a lot. So I see a lot of PhDs and a lot of NGO work, development work, and then, um, and then policy, or I, it lends itself really well to diplomacy too, but I just have less examples of that on my, on my mind right now, but NGO work too. Fantastic. And actually, if you go and visit the program pages, I think at least most programs do have some information about career prospects as well uh, when studying the program. So once again, go to those gold mines, go to the program pages to find more details. So with two minutes to go, I just have one last question. Like I could continue for, for hours to ask you guys questions, of course, and I'm sure the students have tons of questions in their minds as well. Uh, but now they have your contact details as well and can reach out to you. But so, Matthias, is there anything else you would like to add about the European Studies program? If you get to choose anything, what would you like to mention and highlight for the program? Then I would very shortly and generally say a wonderful atmosphere. Uh, we are like a one big happy intellectual family. And it's not just a funny, nice word uh, that I want to say, but I really believe that this is what we are. This is who we are. And per perhaps partially because of our unique profile. Uh, trying to be uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. We have students with so many different backgrounds. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, requirements to apply, well, everybody with a bachelor degrees in social science and or, or humanities, which means that we have students with an interest in uh, political institutions, but also those with a large interest in culture, language, history, uh, and so on. And I think that this mixture pro creates a lot of uh, a, a lot of intellectual stimulation, uh, which is enriching uh, our environment within as well as beyond the classroom setting. Wonderful, thank you, Matthias. And Frank, if I give you the same, perhaps difficult question, no, it should be an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an easier question than I thought um, because um, 
I think one thing I haven't mentioned, and this is the perfect time to mention it, is that, is that when you're a student of the master's program in politics and society of the contemporary Middle East, you're a student of the faculty of social sciences. And that might seem logical, of course you are. But what I mean by that is that graduate school at the faculty of social sciences is unique and it's unique for this university and it's unique for um, a lot of universities in that our whole teaching staff is a collaboration between departments at the faculty. So we don't have full-time employed ones who've been here for 20 years and have done their whole career at their graduate school, but rather we find people throughout the whole faculty who want to collaborate and design really great programs and really great courses. Um, and in that way, it makes it makes the, the atmosphere in the cross classroom not only diverse in terms of the students who are in the audience, but diverse in terms of the teaching staff. And so you get a wide variety of research backgrounds who've come together to, to build your courses and programs. And in that way, you get a lot more exposure to other departments too. And this is, I think, one of the reasons we get a high, a high amount of students who end up employed at our faculty or um, going on to do PhD work or research work or anything, because they've had so many different points of exposure over two years. Um, so, so you're more than just a student of the graduate school, you're really a student of the faculty. And when you're a student of anywhere at Lund University, you get all that comes with, with being at this university. And I really wanna just emphasize again, the student life, because I think that um, that is something that I see time and time and again, it's just so meaningful. It was meaningful to me as a student. I think it's meaningful to everyone who comes here to have just no limit <laughs> to what you can do, what you can explore. Um, you meet so many people from so many places and, and really get the chance over two years to, to discover something or build something. And um, I think that, yeah, you, you get more than just this program when you come to Lund University, you get, you get the whole university, so. You get the whole package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Frank and Matthias, for taking your time to join this session. And thank you for the attendees joining as well. And I learned a lot about your programs, uh, which is also quite fantastic. And, and once again, we have posted the contact details to the program in European Studies and the Middle Eastern program in the chat. But once again, go to the program pages, and that's where you will also find contact details and loads of useful information. But never hesitate to reach out if you have questions. And if you have questions about how to make a master's application, I'm sending another link in the chat right now. It's to our webinar about how to apply for master's studies, which will be hosted on 16th of December. Uh, we had an event two days ago, but we were having another one on 16th of December. So if you missed the first one, go ahead and register for this one instead, where we will walk you through the application steps. So with that, thank you again, Frank and Matthias. Uh, have a lovely evening. Soon it's about to become evening here in Sweden at least. And we'll keep in touch. Thanks everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Bye.